Hello, this is Christopher from Defeat Modernism. In this video, uh, I will present the July-August 2019 edition of the Catholic magazine Chiesa Viva. For those of you unfamiliar with Chiesa Viva, it was founded in 1971 by the late father Luigi Viva, who was ordained in 1942 and passed away in 2012. Uh, may he rest in peace. Father Vila met with Padre Pio in 1957. Uh, he received the assignment to dedicate his entire life to defend the Church of Christ from the work of ecclesiastical Freemasonry. And he received the papal mandate from Pius XII for this task. Padre Pio, he had told Father Vila that our Lord had designs upon him and had chosen him to be educated and trained to fight Freemasonry in the church. Uh, Father Vila was instructed by Padre Pio in three meetings. Uh, this was during the last 15 years of Padre Pio's life. At the close of the second meeting, which took place in the second half of 1963, Padre Pio embraced Father Vila three times and said to him, be brave now for the church has already been invaded by Freemasonry. And then he stated, Freemasonry has already made it to the loafers of the Pope. And at that time, the reigning Pope, or I should say any Pope, was Paul VI. So again, the mission was, was given or entrusted to Father Vila by Padre Pio to fight Freemasonry in the church. And this was approved by Pius XII who gave the, the papal mandate. Uh, Pope Pius XII, Secretary of State, Car uh, Cardinal Tardini, gave Father Vila three cardinals to work with, and they would act as his own uh, personal guardian angels. So those were uh, Cardinal Adoviani, Cardinal Parente, and, Car and Cardinal Palazzini. Uh, Father Vila worked with these three cardinals until their deaths. Uh, the magazine itself is still producing articles. Uh, they're very eye-opening and controversial. Uh, I've read several of them when I was just beginning to make my move into tradition. And this, these articles really gave me a, a great understanding of what happened to the church and who some of the big, uh, big enemies within the church are. Uh, some of the titles that, that I read were Paul VI Beatified, uh, Carol Wotila Beatified, Never, and Vatican II About Face. Uh, I plan to cover all of these editions in the future, but I will place links in the description of this video uh, to a few of the different Kies of Viva sites. Uh, there's, there's many issues that you can download for free. Uh, all of them are in Italian, with several in English, uh, some in Spanish, and a few in French. This particular video will be taken from the July-August 2019 edition, which exposes the, the diabolical secret of Paul VI Mass, uh, also known as the New Mass or the Novus Ordo. The article covers the main players in the creation of the New Mass uh, and the Second Vatican Council, namely Anabali Bunini, Angelo Roncalli, who would become John XXIII, and Gian Giambattista Montini, also known as Paul VI. The article will show the connection of Freemasonry to these individuals and to the creation of the new mass. Uh, there's a fair amount of World War II history in it as well. Uh, there's a lot of information in this, so I'm gonna break this up into two parts. Uh, also, please remember to subscribe to my Rumble channel as well, because there are videos that I'll upload there that I can't on YouTube. Uh, I'll place a link in the description of this video uh, for that channel as well. So now let's go to the article, which will be read by who I affectionately call Sir Alfred the Great. In the article, A Liturgical Reform for the Destruction of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, April 20, 2018. We read, Anibale Bonini, filed with the code name of the Masonic Lodge where he belonged, born 1365-75, is without a doubt the greatest magician of all times. Deceiving, 
without anyone noticing, except for a few well-informed dumb dogs, and under everybody's eyes he had, in fact, actively worked for the liturgical reform under the guidance of Giambattista Montini, Paul VI, with the manipulation of the offertory, which precedes the consecration, he transformed the Holy Mass into a Rosicrucian rite. To better understand the personality, attitudes, ties and dark secrets of this great magician, we publish the letter of assignment, sent in 1964, from the Council of the Brothers to the Brotherborn, Monsignor Enibile Bonini, and four other letters that Monsignor Bonini sent to the Grand Master, in the period 1964 to 1973, to keep him informed of his liturgical activity aimed at the dechristianization and to desacralization of the Mass and of the Christian people. These letters were given to me by Father Luigi Villa, several years ago, with the hope that, one day, they would shed some light on certain creativities in the liturgical field. Letter of July 14, 1964 Dearborn, we inform you of the task, that the Council of the Brethren has established for you in agreement with the Grand Master and the Prince's Assistant to the Throne, and we oblige you, 1. To make yours the program of rocker, former priest, one will have to arrive at a new religion, new dogma, new rite, new priesthood through the naturalization of the Incarnation. 2. Achieve a reversal authority, the authorities of the Church must remain, but they must limit themselves to approve the decisions of the base. 3. To spread the dechristianization through the confusion of the rites and of the languages and put priests, bishops and cardinals one against the other, the linguistic and ritual Babel will be our victory, as the linguistic and ritual unity has been the strength of the Church. 4. To choose the most suitable and secret members among the clergy, and to report them immediately so they can be approached and contracted. Everything has to happen within a decade. Your fixed salary is 500,000 liras monthly that could be increased or doubled according to success. All the details will be given verbally. The brothers of the Council united with the Grand Master are embracing you. To the brother born by hand. Letter of July 21, 1964 Incomparable Grand Master. Dear Councillors, your letter of the 14 cm obliges me first of all to thank you for the trust you place in me in the whole realization of Brother Rocker's program. In particular, 1. I have already chosen the collaborators that I will personally present to you and whom you will engage according to the specific tasks, they are experts in the various subjects and teachers of the various Roman pontifical universities. 2. My task will be very easy and attainable because I have as my close friends Cardinal Lercaro and the same Paul VI who is giving me the maximum confidence in everything, so he will never suspect my relations with you. I will do my best for the priest, this part of the letter is unreadable, to become Pontifical Master of Ceremonies, then all will be easier. 3. The desacralization will have to proceed by steps, so I am begging you to be understanding with me. We need to introduce Protestant and Orthodox elements in the Catholic liturgy with the excuse of ecumenism, then the road is open to everything. All this takes time, but in ten years we will succeed. While I repeat my thanks, I assure you that I am already hard at work and soon I will come to see you. Hugs from your brother, signed, born, to the Grand Master Justiniani Palace. Letter of April 6, 1967. Grand Master. Dear Councillors, as I had promised, the road to desacralization has now been opened with the official publication of the instruction of the sacred music of March 5th. As you could have seen, it is a very deliberate, ambiguous and devious document. Even though, in fact, certain traditional principles are reaffirmed, 
virtually in passing and so as not to attract attention, I fought to highlight some points, 1. The prominent part of the people, 2. The vernacular language, before the official language, 3. The role of women, who may also form a scholar cantorum, 4. The various degrees of participation, for which it breaks up the preceding system, until no one can sing or participate anymore. 5. Freedom for the various kinds of composition and instruments. More could have been done but, as I told you verbally, there is the serious difficulty of the Congregation of Rites, whose secretary is my archenemy, Antonelli. You should, through our brother's assistance at the throne, to abolish that congregation and put me in place of Antonelli. But of this, we will discuss verbally. Best wishes from your brother, signed, born, to the Grand Master Giustiniani Palace. Letter of July 2, 1967. Incomparable Grand Master. Distinguished counsellors, the degrees of the desacralization are proceeding very fast. In fact another instruction has come out whose implementation has started June 29th. We can now sing victory because, 1. The vulgar language is sovereign throughout the liturgy even in the essential parts. 2. The sacred garments are reduced more and more. 3. Maximum freedom of choice of the various forms up to private creativity and to chaos. 4. Abolished genuflections, kisses, bows, ceremonies, ritual prescriptions. In short, with this a document, I think to have sown the principle of the maximum libertinage, according to your dispositions. I fought hard and had to resort to all the tricks to get it approved by the Pope, against my enemies of the Congregation of the Rites. Fortunately for us we immediately found support in friends and brothers of the Laos University, who are faithful. I thank you for the sum sent and hoping to see you as soon as possible, I embrace you. Your brother. Signed, Born. To the Grand Master Giustiniani Palace. Letter of October 22, 1973. Venerable Grand Master. Dear Distinguished Assistants. In reference to your 17 CM. I will tell you that I can perfectly understand your concern for the evil that the Holy Year can do. But I would like to inform you immediately that I have gathered our following promptly brothers, Eber, Fragi, Mani, Gigi, Chi, Monda, Mago, Saba, Biji, Gaika, Pinpi, Salma, and Lube. All of our most faithful theologians. They have the task of studying how to diminish as much as possible the importance and necessity of the Holy Year in such a way that it is not heard either by the clergy or by the people. They will organize conferences and conventions and widespread distributions of printouts among the young clergy easily vulnerable to certain problems. A conference will be certainly organized in Assisi as a base of launching of ideas against the Holy Year. I thank you for your trust and for what you are doing for me, hoping to talk to us as soon as possible, with kind regards. YB. Signed, Born. To the Grand Master Giustiniani Palace. Let us continue with the text of the article, let us examine the difference between the usual prayer, the Sushi Pe Sancta Trinitas. At the conclusion of the offer and which has been abolished, and the Benedict you are Lord, God of the universe of the invented right. 1. Accept, O Holy Trinity, this offering we make you in remembrance of the Passion, Resurrection and Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of the blessed ever Virgin Mary, Saint John the Baptist, Holy Apostles Peter, and Paul, of these martyrs who have the relics here in the altar, and of all the other saints, so that it may be to their honor and our salvation and may they deign to intercede for us in heaven, 
while we celebrate their memory on earth. We ask you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 2. Blessed are you, Lord, God of the universe, for through your goodness we have received this bread, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, that we offer to you because will become for us bread of eternal life. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be the Lord forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of the universe, for through your goodness we have received this wine, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, that we offer to you because will become for us drink of safety. Blessed be the Lord forever. Nobody notices a thing, the hidden ace, concealed in the sleeve, is extracted and voila, gentlemen, you're done. Hear the offering of the pure and immaculate victim infinitely pleasing to the Father, is substituted by the most banal fruits of the earth and of the work of man. Exactly that which God abhors. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 3, in fact, we read. Cain offered the fruits of the earth in sacrifice to the Lord. Fruits that the Lord did not like at all. But these fruits of the work of man, so unwelcome to God, who preferred with all obviousness, the Immaculate Host, the Lamb without stain that Abel was offering to him, arousing the homicidal envy of Cain, they are brought no less than to the Lord, God of the universe. In fact, we wondered, why the Most Holy Trinity, perfect and total Catholic expression, has been replaced by the God of the universe. Maybe that this expression indicates the same entity. Blessed are you, God of the universe is an expression of the Jewish Kabbalah. In fact it is not said, Blessed are you, God, creator of the universe let alone the explicit reference to the Most Holy Trinity, but, Blessed are you, God of the universe, that is not God creator, but God immanent to the universe, soul of matter. This expression is typically taken from the Jewish Kabbalah, disease that had infected all the new and raving modernist anti-theology. We really thought, until recently, that these considerations were exaggerated, hallucinations of incurable conspiracy theorists, that was not possible to go that far, until we have been caught in dismay in reading a text of 1895, of Domenico Margiotta, famous representative of the highest degree of the new and reformed Palladic Rite. The new name of the Illuminati of Bavaria, founded by the Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Masonry, Albert Pike and by his deputy Giuseppe Mozzini who was a skillful worshipper of the Baphomet Lucifer, but later he dissociated himself and converted to Catholicism. Here is the text that we reproduce with horror. What then is the Lord of the heavens if not the God of the lazy, of the indolents and of the vagabonds who imagine the spirit and gorge themselves with matter, who exist on ideas and consume reality? There is no spirit without matter. And they are identified with one another otherwise, the Lord of the heavens is the God of nothingness, while Satan is instead the God of the universe. The God of the universe because he understands, spirit and matter in only one being, the one cannot subsist without the other. That alone must be for us the God that governs both, and that is Satan. Here is how the sacrifice of Christ offered to the Most Holy Trinity for the redemption of humanity is transformed into a deicide offered to Lucifer, God of the Universe. The Catholic Mass, of Paul VI, becomes the rite of the Rosicrucian night in which precisely the Immaculate Lamb, that is beheaded, with his limbs cut off and thrown into the fire, is offered to the Baphomet Lucifer for the Gnostic Satanic redemption of man. Now, reading the letters exchanged between Monsignor Bonini and his bosses in masonry, it seems that he was more than a subtle and cunning trickster, he simply was a poor Judas with a salary doubled according to the results and who had only one way before him, the obligation of obeying the orders of his superiors in masonry. Therefore, it was not just from a magician's sleeve, 
that the hidden aces which Bonini inserted into the new liturgical reform, but they were coming from unknown superiors who didn't have to show their face and even less didn't have to give an explanation about the content of the transferred orders. The cited article continues with these words, no one had even remotely thought about the satanic and esoteric aspect of the new rite. Reading this article, surely there will be those who will turn up their nose, incredulously faced with such serious statements about what, in all probability, is considered the holy mass, well, the truth must not be silenced not even before the general incredulity, especially if the good of immortal souls is at stake. Beyond the effect that the expression God of the universe can have on the celebration of the holy sacrifice of the mass, when the priest, oblivious of the esoteric meaning of the words he whispers, first raising the pattern with the bread and later the chalice with the wine, we are interested in discovering the origin of this satanic will to profane the Catholic mass and to verify whether this diabolical will was, even if in a hidden way, officially and perhaps even publicly exalted and glorified. Although this may have happened unbeknownst to an unsuspecting public. If this were proven, then Paul the Sixth of Mass, covered in infamy and abomination, should be repudiated and buried forever. The Preparation of the Kingdom of the Antichrist The expulsion of Monsignor Montini from the Secretary of State, the murder of Pius XII, the fraudulent election of John XXIII and Paul VI, the persecution and poisoning of Padre Pio, the corruption of the clergy and the people, had a common thread that was initiated by the head of the Illuminati, via the corruption of the clergy. Gave birth to the kingdom of the Antichrist and has now reached the height of such corruption that is a prelude to the last act that will provoke the intervention of God. The plot of this story began with Nubius, supreme head of the Order of the Illuminati of Bavaria, later to become Universal Freemasonry and, later, the new reformed Palladic Rite, who, in the early decades of the 19th century, drew up a plan for the complete annihilation of Catholicism and even of the Christian idea. To do this, however, a corrupt Pope was needed to initiate the Kingdom of the Antichrist, to then achieve the supreme purpose of Satan. The total elimination of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the face of the earth. With reference to the recently published book, The Secret of the Empty Tomb of Padre Pio, both for the details and for the bibliographic notes, in this exhibition, we limit ourselves to provide a simple list of dates, documents, facts and events, to summarize briefly the story of a planned corruption that led us to the final act, the elimination of the Mass of St. Pius V. Here is the satanic plan extracted from the secret instructions of Nubius and other members of the Alta Vendita. Our ultimate goal is that of Voltaire and the French Revolution, that is, the complete annihilation of Catholicism, and even of the Christian idea. Catholicism, even less than the monarchy, does not fear the tip of one dagger, but these two bases of the social order can fall under the weight of corruption. Therefore let us never tire of corrupting. The best dagger to assassinate the church and strike her in the heart is corruption. So, let us work until it is completed. We popularize the vice in the multitudes. May they breathe it with the five senses, that they drink it, that they saturate. Make vicious hearts and you will no longer have Catholics. Remove the priest from work, from the altar and from virtue, dexterously seek to occupy his thoughts and time elsewhere. Make him idle, a glutton, he will become ambitious, intriguing and perverse. We have undertaken corruption in a big way, the corruption of the people through the clergy, and the clergy through us, the corruption that must lead us to the burial of the church. We need to eliminate Catholics from the world. We only conspire against Rome. It is the moral that is important to strike, we must, therefore, hurt the heart. What we have to look for and wait for, as the Jews are waiting for the Messiah, 
is a Pope according to our needs. We do not doubt at all to reach this supreme point of our efforts. But when? And how? To the youth we must aim, we must seduce the young. It is necessary that we attract the youth, without being aware of it, under the banner of secret societies. In a few years this young clergy will, by force of circumstances, have invaded all the offices. He will govern, administer, judge, and be called to elect the future Pope. This Pope will also necessarily be imbued with the Italian and humanitarian principles that we are now beginning to put into circulation. Do you want to revolutionize Italy? Look for the Pope whose portrait we have made. Do you want to establish the kingdom of the elect on the throne of the whore of Babylon? Let the clergy walk under your banner, believing they are walking under the banner of the apostolic keys. Stretch out your nets to the bottom of the sacristies, seminaries and convents. You will catch friends and lead them to the feet of the apostolic chair. You have thus caught a revolution in tiara and cope, preceded by the cross and the banner, a revolution that will only need a little help to set the four corners of the world on fire. This was the plan of the years 1818 to 1836, to assassinate the Church of Christ corruption had to be used, mainly of the clergy, in order to obtain a corrupt Pope who could ignite the revolution to the four corners of the earth. Did Nubius know that the dagger that would have definitively murdered the Church of Christ was the dagger of the Rosicrucian knight who, instead of celebrating the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, offered to the Holy Trinity, would celebrate the deicide in Holocaust to Lucifer? Giambattista Montini Giambattista Montini was ordained a priest on May 29, 1920 and continued his studies at the Pontifical Gregorian University. At the Pontifical Academy of Ecclesiastical Nobles he established a friendship, which marked his life, with the Sicilian Mariano Rampola del Tindero, great-grandson of Cardinal Mariano Rampola died in 1913 and that, from the documents found in his office, turned out to be the head of the Ordo Templi Orientis, the institution of the Illuminati of Bavaria that promotes satanic corruption, in high-level environments, as an indispensable means to gain control of high personalities. In 1923, Montini was commissioned by Pius XI to take care of the Roman University Circle. In October 1924, Montini was called to work in the Secretariat of State employed by Monsignor Giuseppe Pizzardo, Cardinal Pietro Gaspari and Monsignor Francesco Borgognini Duca, first papal nuncio after the signing of the Lotteron Pacts and friend of Angelo Roncalli. In October 1925, Montini was appointed National Ecclesiastical Assistant of the Federation of Italian Catholic Universities. In 1926, Montini was registered as a homosexual by the Milan's Vice Squad. On February 12, 1933, a Jesuit father discerned in the apostolate of Monsignor Montini in the FUCI a disturbing encroachment within the ambit of its members. Montini was forced to resign, which were operational on March 12, 1933. From the archives of the Italian Ministry of the Interior it appears that the FUCI National Ecclesiastical Assistant, Monsignor Montini had been caught, with a person of the same sex, in a public urinal performing obscene acts against morality. In 1934, Montini went to England with his friend Monsignor Rampola del Tindero, nephew of Cardinal Rampola. In the mid-1930s, Montini befriended certain singular individuals who shared the same sexual orientation such as, Hugh Montgomery, brother of the famous artist Peter Montgomery, a longtime homosexual partner of the Cambridge spy Anthony Blunt, who then went to the Soviet camp. Another was Viscount Evan Tredegar, who enjoyed titillating his friends with stories about his sexual and occult prowess, including his direct experiences in black masses using human blood, 
urine and sperm. Tredegar, who later returned to England, kept a photograph of the young Montini cheek to cheek with a handsome sailor. On December 16, 1937, Montini was appointed deputy to the Secretariat of State, under the Secretary of State Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. On March 2, 1939, Pacelli became Pope Pius XII and Montini remained in office at the Secretariat of State, along with Monsignor Domenico Tardini. In 1939, Montini, in Poland, because of his hatred of the Germans and Germany, he presented a Vatican point of view, entirely his own, advising Poland to open fire on the German army. After the war broke out, Montini organized the research and information service for prisoners in each country and the Relief Commission, which later became the Pontifical Assistance Commission. For the duration of the war, Montini, a priest, diplomat by day and conspirator by night, had close relations with personnel from the military intelligence services of the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor of the CIA, as well as with the personnel of the British intelligence and Soviet intelligence. In return, the Office of Strategic Services, commenced filling the Vatican treasury with dollars, as well as the coffers of the Sicilian Mafia and Freemasonry, to accelerate the invasion of Sicily. Montini was responsible for obtaining intelligence information, acquired by the Jesuits in Japan, which was used by the Allies to identify the strategic targets to be bombed in that country. In 1943, Montini lost both parents, on January 12, his father died, on May 15, his mother. Montini dedicated a tombstone to his mother, of which he, himself, was designer. A composition of esoteric symbolism that demonstrates a terrible reality was sculpted on it, the predestination of Monsignor Montini as Patriarch of the World, head of the Illuminati of Bavaria or even better the second beast of the Apocalypse of Saint John. In 1944, at the death of Cardinal Moglioni, Pius XII did not elect a new Secretary of State, and so Monsignor Montini and Monsignor Domenico Tardini remained pro-secretaries of state until 1954, when Montini was expelled from Rome by Pope Pius XII himself. In the summer of 1944, without the knowledge of Pius XII, Monsignor Montini entered into high-level negotiations with the Italian communists. His goal was to form an alliance between the Christian Democratic Party, the Socialists and the Communists. On 10 July 1944, there was a meeting between Monsignor Montini and Palmiro Tagliati, the undisputed leader of the Italian Communist Party. This was the first contact between the Vatican and a leader of communism. In 1945, on the eve of the Yalta Conference, Monsignor Montini met the communist Eugenio Reale, with the intention of organizing a meeting between Tagliati and the Pope. While Monsignor Montini gave vent to his anti-fascism with his secret contacts with high-level communist representatives, his family manifested this political passion of the left in an even more disturbing way. In an article written by the attorney Salvatore Macca, former president of the Court of Brescia, entitled, The Montini Helped the Communist, terrorists to kill people with bombs, one can read information on the activity of the communist partisan, Leonardo Speziale who, after many instances and criminal convictions for crimes of blood, injuries and voluntary murder, escaped from prison in France, and returned to Italy, settling in Brescia, at the home of the Montini family. On October 31, 1943 in Brescia, Speziale with a bomb, caused the deaths of the director of the judicial prison, who was a father of five children, and of a 19-year-old soldier, both torn apart by the explosion, and then later he returned to the Montini house for dinner. Here is the version of Speziale on the topic of the hospitality of the Montinis. Mama and Papa Montini knew that I was one of those who put the bombs in the barracks of the Nazi fascists, I myself, 
made several of them right at home, and yet, they let me stay with them continuing to offer me hospitality but above all, they exhibited solidarity and affection. As well, all the members of the family in whose workshop the bombs were used in the attacks were made were Catholics. They did it because they were convinced of that choice, aware of the risk they were running. Not to be exalted. Speciale explains again, that in Valtrompier he had managed, to form a first group of partisans, numerically strong but poorly equipped, which was replenished with the necessary thanks to the precious collaboration of the brothers Giacomino, and Franco Montini della Stocchetta, a place near Brescia. The terrorist Leonardo Speziale, then received the reward for his activities, on December 26, 1944, he was given the post of military inspector for the Veneto, which he would then exercise until the end of the conflict. At that time, in the Veneto area, the presence of the trusted man of Monsignor Giambattista Montini, Loris Capovola, who, ordained a priest on May 23, 1940, collaborated with the partisan resistance after September 8, 1943, with the credentials semi-unknown to most, of his fraternal head of Mester's communist cell, Don Loris Capovola drowned in a murky past of red violence linked to the civil war in northern Italy. In the period 1944-45, Don Capovola will become the black guardian angel of Monsignor Angelo Roncalli, managing a tangle of clandestine business and political activities. After the war, from a secret report by the security services of Fiat, the political action of Capovola took shape which, through the trade unions and the Italian Communist Party, he began to take his place, at the forefront, in the process of communization of the Italian nation, with the opening to the left in order to shift the entire Western bloc of European countries, to the left. On April 11, 1953, Wilma Montesi's body was found on a beach south of Rome, lapped by the waves. The Montesi case broke out, after it was discovered that the girl had participated in a black mass with a subsequent orgy, at a hunting lodge, near Rome. The puppet master of this scandal was the Marquis Ugo Montagna, whom Guy Carr, one of the leading experts on Freemasonry, identified as the political leader of the Illuminati of Bavaria in Italy, whose task was to control Mussolini and wait for the opportune moment, to initiate a left turn in Italian politics. In 1954, the Montesi case vanished into thin air. However, due to the indictment of Pietro Piccioni, it obtained the result of crushing the presidential candidacy of the Christian democracy, of Pietro's father, Attilio Piccioni, who, as a Christian Democratic secretary, ran the fateful election campaign of 1948, fought courageously against the threat of communism. Italy was ready for the opening to the left, so much greatly coveted by Monsignor Giambattista Montini. With the church that was unexpectedly at the service of Karl Marx it happened that a mentor Fonfani, strongly inspired by Monsignor Loris Capovilla, was commissioned to develop the opening to the left program in Italy. Montini was ready to promote the turn to the left of Italian politics, which he intended to carry out with his men of the Christian Democratic Party, the party to which he and his entire family had religiously dedicated themselves, but an unexpected event occurred. The expulsion of Monsignor Giambattista Montini from the Secretariat of State, on November 1, 1954, and the significant silence of Pius XII against him, after being appointed Archbishop of Milan, created a new situation for Montini and for high Freemasonry. Montini was shocked. The predestined of high Freemasonry to occupy the throne of Peter and the summit of the Order of the Illuminati had been exiled and barred from the Cardinalate and then to the Papacy. At the beginning of 1955, the epistolary and personal contacts of Montini with Masiga Roncalli. For the High Masonry the only way was to bring Roncalli to the papal throne, 
to solve the problem of the Cardinalate of Messiga Montini who would then open the way to the pontificate. In 1956, Father Luigi Villa, in his first meeting with Padre Pio, received the assignment to dedicate his entire life to defend the Church of Christ from the work of ecclesiastical Freemasonry and, having received the papal mandate from Pius XII for this task, he was placed under the direction of Cardinal Ottaviani, Prefect of the Holy Office, Cardinal Parente, and Cardinal Palazzini. The interval between the expulsion of Monsignor Montini from the Secretariat of State and the death of Pius XII, was very delicate for Freemasonry, because of the fact that a threat had been created by Pius XII who stayed alive too long. Here is the version of what Don Villa said and was known to the Holy Office, we think that Pius XII was killed for two reasons, if Pius XII had lived another year and a half, the plan of the worldwide Freemasonry which was to put their man, Montini, at the head of the church would have failed. In 1960, Pius XII would certainly have published the third secret of Fatima which contained the phrase, Satan will actually succeed in reaching the top of the church. Furthermore, Freemasonry could not have imposed Ron Carly, as their transition pope, because, at that time, he was already suffering from cancer and had been given only five years to live. And Montini would never have become a cardinal, and therefore, never a pope. Now, let's get back to the Montesi case, the Vatican was also touched by the crisis, because it was discovered that the adventurer, Montagna, was close to the personal doctor of the Pope, Riccardo Galeazzi Lissi, who will be driven from the sacred palaces for having photographed dying Pius XII and for having sold the images to a weekly tabloid. But it was Ugo Montagna who organized the Black Mass and consequent bacchanal orgy, complete with English, French, American and Italian priestesses actresses who caused the death of Wilma Montesi and he used blackmail to force many people to yield to the will of the masters, the Illuminati. And what treatment could the Illuminati reserve for Pius XII who, if he had remained alive for another year and a half, could have undermined their supreme plan of putting their chief on the throne of Peter? At this point we ask, did Monsignor Montini, who was to become the supreme head of the Order of the Illuminati of Bavaria and sit on the throne of Peter, and who had as an obstacle Pius XII who could have survived until 1960, perhaps know the Marquis Ugo Montagna. Did Monsignor Montini know that Riccardo Galeazzi Lissi was an intimate friend of Montagna? Was he aware of the use that Montagna made of his black masses and bacchanal orgies to impose his blackmail on his intimate friends? In the book by Franco Belligrandi, Nikita Roncalli Against the Life of a Pope, we read this sentence, they went further and wanted to make them believe that Monsignor, Montini, had even witnessed certain black masses. It was Father Lombardi, who gave the news to Pope Pius XII. In an article, dated June 22, 2008, by Alberto Bertotto, one can read a confidence that Pound's daughter, Mary de Rachel Witts, made to Professor Antonio Pantano, namely that the homicidal mission of U.S. assassins, who were to kill Benito Mussolini, would be organized by Angleton, after input of the Vatican's pro-secretary of state, Monsignor Giambattista Montini, supported by his faithful Tagliati. J. J. Angleton had assumed the position of head of the X2, the office in Italy for the counter-espionage of the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, from 1944 to 1947, and it was a known fact that he profitably used the information network that had set up the Holy See as, an intelligence service which, in those years, was headed by the pious Monsignor Giambattista Montini. One of the greatest experts on the Illuminati conspiracy, Guy Carr, in his book The Red Fog Over America, writes, It is known that Ugo Montagna, upon the arrival of the Allied forces, and by virtue of his friendship organized the escape of Mussolini and Patacci. He, however, secretly betrayed them, 
handing them over to an enlightened member of the Communist Party, who had them intercepted. In light of these facts, we now find it more difficult to think that Monsignor Montini did not know the Marquis Ugo Montagna. Pope Pius XII died on October 9, 1958. On October 26, 1958, the papal princes of the church elected Cardinal Giuseppe Siri of Genoa as the successor of Pope Pius XII. The new pope had accepted the office by becoming the 262nd Vicar of Christ, informing the cardinals that he had assumed the name of Gregory XVII. Since, according to canon law, the resignation of a pope, duly elected and who accepted the position, is null and void, Gregory XVII remained the true Vicar of Christ until his death in 1989. But the Illuminati had other preferences and other programs. In this regard, we recall the revelation made to Franco Bellagrandi by the economist, politician, writer and journalist, Count Paolo Sella di Montelluce, in September 1958, about seven or eight days before the conclave, I was in the sanctuary of Europa, at one of the usual dinners of the group of Attilio Barto. That day, a character I knew as a high Masonic authority in contact with the Vatican was invited. He told me that the next Pope would not have been Siri, as was rumored in some Roman circles, because he was a cardinal too authoritarian. A conciliation Pope would have been elected, the Patriarch of Venice, Ron Carly, had already been chosen. To the question, chosen by whom? From our Masons represented in the Conclave the Masonic High Authority answered me serenely. Are there Masons in the Conclave? Of course, he answered, the Church is in our hands. Then who is in charge of the Church? After a brief silence, the voice of the High Masonic Authority chanted sharply, No one can say where the summits are. The vertices are hidden. The day after, Count Seller transcribed in an official document, which is now kept in the notary's safe, the name and surname of that character and his amazing complete declaration of the year, month, day and time. That which was stated in a few days turned out to be absolutely correct. What threats caused Pope Gregory XVII to resign? The unofficial version was that of death threats to Cardinal Giuseppe Siri and the extermination of his entire family, but the most effective was that of the extermination of the entire top of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. By now, the atomic bomb existed, and the effects had been demonstrated on August 6 and 9, 1945, on Japan. The first nuclear test of the United States took place on July 16, 1945, in a place called, Trinity. We recall that, in March 1945, Japan had communicated its unconditional surrender to the United States. However, ignoring this surrender, the US continued to bomb the Japanese cities because the Roosevelt administration wanted to prolong the war in order to develop the atomic bomb to try it on the yellow race and then demonstrate to the whole world the power and destructive abilities acquired by the United States. Around 8.15 am on August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb, never dropped in human history, exploded at a height of 580 meters above the center of Hiroshima. In a few moments, the city was reduced to a parched land. After just three days, on August 9, a new, more powerful atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, a city that had already been hit by incendiary bombing, and was built on a series of hills that would have limited the effectiveness of the atomic bomb. This second bomb was destined to hit Kokura, one of Japan's main naval arsenals, and why was it dropped on Nagasaki, when President Truman, in his diary, had written about using it only on military targets. From the research done, it appears that due to the atomic bombing of Nagasaki there is officially no one responsible above the rank of Colonel. 
24 hours too late, President Truman sent a new order to the aviation, from now on, no bomb should be dropped without his explicit consent. What a farce. 70% of Japanese Catholics lived in Nagasaki. Nagasaki and Hiroshima were the cities in which almost all of Japan's Catholics lived. So, the first two U.S. atomic bombs were, yes, dropped on the yellow race, but killed almost all of the Catholics of Japan. What, then, was the real intent of these two first atomic bombs dropped on Japan that no one in high places wanted to take responsibility for? The perennial spokesman of the anti-Catholic establishment, Herbert George Wells, published his book Crux Anzata, in which he openly advocated the destruction of the Vatican, why don't we bomb Rome? A total bombardment, like the one in Berlin, of the Italian capital seems not only desirable but necessary. In fact, during the Second World War, the Allied bombs struck the Vatican twice and since then Pope Pius XII, having gathered the cardinals, advised them to prepare themselves to elect a successor pope outside of Italy, in case he was killed. In May 1945, the armed conflict in Europe had come to an end, but the violent intimidation tactics exercised by the enemies of the Church against the Pope did not stop with the end of the war. Many facts indicate that, since 1949, the secular powers had been trying to intimidate Pope Pius XII with the threat of a nuclear bomb on the Vatican to force a change in the teaching of the Church which hindered the agenda of the emerging world government of the Antichrist. As part of the Freemasonry offensive against the Church, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the rabidly anti-Catholic writer, Avro Manhattan, launched a public threat against the Pope, in the form of a book, with which he boldly announced, the Catholic Church intervenes in the affairs of political bodies with the same energy, audacity, cunning and determination, as it did in the period between the two world wars. The atomic bombs, which in a few seconds, swept Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the face of the earth and brought Japan to their knees should be a warning to all those forces that are involved with the future of mankind and that the methods of non-negotiable principles of the ages past eras are outdated forever. Unless new horizons are opened, new methods are devised and a new spirit is encouraged, economic systems, social doctrines and political regimes, as well as religious institutions, will inevitably collapse upon themselves and upon all humanity causing an ultimate complete annihilation. The Catholic Church would not be an exception at all and, like all other institutions in the world, should pay attention to this warning and, by keeping pace with the spirit of the 20th century, should try to follow a new path. Alice B. Bailey, the former High Priestess of what is now known as the New Age, in 1957, a year before the death of Pope Pius XII, described, in no uncertain terms, how the world powers tried to secretly terrorize the Church with their nuclear weapons. This served to pave the way for a UN of world religions, as a necessary ingredient for the new world government and for the creation of a single culture and a single world humanity. Alice Bailey founded the International Masonic Satanic Organization, Lucifer Trust, equals the Court of Lucifer, then, more prudently called Lucis Trust, which directs the UN. Bailey writes of her new religion, the risen Christ and not the crucified Christ will be the distinguishing feature of the new religion, and a new Church of God, drawn from all religions and all spiritual groups, will put an end to the great heresies of separateness. But to achieve this, Bailey demanded a decisive rejection of dogmas that is, all the statements with which alleged truths are formed as they cause discord and war. The programs of the UN and the world government that concern man and his destinies, on the other hand, are described to us with merciless sincerity by the famous Englishman and world philosopher, Bertrand Russell. In 1902, at the age of 18, 
to his friend Gilbert Murray, who later became the first president of the League of Nations, Russell wrote, The only thing I hear, which is worth doing, would be to kill as many people as possible, so as to diminish the global consciousness of the world. The solution he proposed was that of war, war could become so destructive that, for once and for any rate of population growth, there would be no danger of overpopulation. But the war disappointed him, in fact he later wrote, the war has so far been disappointing in this respect, but perhaps bacteriological war will prove more effective. If a black plague could break out all over the world, with each generation, the survivors could freely procreate without too much populating of this planet. But what fascinated him most was the atomic bomb, it is not at all improbable that the great military powers of the world know their destruction for their inability to refrain from war. And to this world, terrified by the threat of a nuclear holocaust, Russell offered a remedy, to change its religious, moral and cultural matrix and become estranged from any consideration of truth and justice, in order to accept a world government with its genocidal policies. The most important topic to use, for Russell, is mass psychology, future psychologists will need to have classes of children who will inculcate the belief that snow is black. And the goal to be achieved, Russell explains with these words, learn to submit to the law, even when it is imposed by foreigners whom we despise and hate, and who are known to be completely foreign to any consideration of justice. Considering the writings of characters like Alice Bailey, H. G. Wells, A. Manhattan, B. Russell, the test calendar of the various nuclear weapons, conducted in 1958, is now of enormous importance. The incredible increase in nuclear bomb detonations, by the United States and the USSR, occurred precisely during 1958, more than in any other previous year. In fact, there were more explosions of nuclear weapons during the 18 days, between the death of Pius XII and the triumph of the Masonic forces at the conclave that followed, than those that occurred during a similar period of time since the first US nuclear test that took place in 1945. The nuclear tests of the Soviet Union began on September 24, 1957 and continued sporadically and with little power until early October 1958. From October 10 to 25, 1958, exactly the period in which the Cardinals isolated themselves in the Sistine Chapel to elect the Pope, there was a noticeable increase in nuclear tests both in number and in power. Not to be outdone, the Americans did their part to keep the level of nuclear terror high until the election of the new pope. During the same period, the United States conducted unprecedented nuclear tests by type and by number. From May 28, 1957 to October 29, 1958, there were 77 nuclear tests. According to former FBI consultant Paul L. Williams, Declassified U.S. intelligence documents confirm that in the 1958 conclave in the third ballot, Siri, according to FBI sources, obtained the votes needed to be elected Pope Gregory XVII. The white smoke came out of the chimney of the chapel informing the faithful that they had a new pope. Vatican Radio announced the news with joy at 6 a.m. The announcer said, the smoke is white. There is absolutely no doubt. A pope has been elected. But the new pope didn't show up on the balcony. Then the doubts began to arise if the smoke had been white or gray. In the evening, Vatican Radio announced that the results had remained uncertain. But the announcements made in the world were valid. On the fourth ballot, according to FBI sources, Siri still obtained the necessary votes to be re-elected as Supreme Pontiff again, but the French cardinals cancelled the results, claiming that the election of Siri would cause unrest and the murder of several prominent bishops beyond the Iron Curtain. Finally, on the third day of balloting, Ron Carly received the necessary support to become Pope John XXIII. 
Father Paolo Perota, in his mainstream account of the election of John XXIII, reveals his awareness that the 1958 conclave could have become the target of a nuclear attack, writing, if all the cardinals were killed, how could it take place? Today with an atomic bomb, the right to elect the bishops of Rome would return to the body that originally possessed it and of which the cardinals are their representatives, that is to say, the clergy of the Eternal City. In his 1972 essay, The Election of the Roman Pontiff, Giuseppe Siri wrote, Today, some superpowers have too great an interest in possessing, for their part, the highest moral authority in the world. And they would do anything in their power to achieve this goal. The pressures to overthrow the substance of the law of the conclave would be driven by the desire to obtain precisely this result. In a 1985 statement, to the French journalist, Louis Hubert Remy, Giuseppe Siri said, This secret, of the conclave, is horrible. Very serious things have happened. But I can't say anything. On October 28, 1958, the Mason, Angelo Roncalli, described by Avro Manhattan as the Kremlin candidate, suddenly appeared on the papal balcony and on the world scene as Pope John XXIII. In reality, it was the anti-Pope John XXIII who appeared on the world scene. This was the first time, since 1378, that the cardinals would have deceived the conclave's outsiders on the identity of the prelate they had elected pope, with the unintended consequences of launching the great schism of the West which lasted decades and which created a series of anti-popes. Once Cardinal Giuseppe Siri was replaced by Cardinal Angelo Roncalli on the chair of Peter, and after the structures of the Vatican were totally brought under the heel of the Masonic world powers, in the span of just 48 hours, the United States and the Soviet Union simultaneously announced the suspension of their respective nuclear test programs. The connection of the two events speaks volumes if seen in the context of what happened to the Church immediately after the Conclave of 1958. The pontificate of the anti-Pope John XXIII was only a pontificate of transition, which served exclusively to elevate Monsignor Montini to the Cardinalate and put him in a position to be imposed as a later Pope. The Freemason John XXIII was a simple pawn, and an executor of the indications that Montini, from his position as Archbishop of Milan, transmitted to him through his trusted man, Monsignor Loris Capovola. But John XXIII was also the executor of orders or suggestions that came from the summits of certain powerful Masonic lodges. In the book The Eclipsed Church, by Louis Hubert Remy, the author goes to New York to interview the Jesuit, Father Malachi Martin. To the question, was John XXIII a Mason? The Jesuit replied, on the belonging of John XXIII to Freemasonry, all the evidence is in the Vatican archives, jealously preserved by Cardinal Angelo Sodano. To another question, made in September 1996, was John XXIII an initiate? Certain documents call him brother. What do you think? Malachi Martin replied, yes, he was initiated by Vincent Oriel. In a phone call, that I took in Father Luigi Villa's office, the converser a distinguished international diplomat and lawyer told me that Roncalli was a pedophile and a mason and continued, when he was nuncio in Paris, one day, Roncalli was called by the French president, Vincent Oriel, who told him, your little vice, for us, is not a problem, if you enter the Grand Orient, you will become cardinal and I will put the red cap on your head. And if, one day, you become Pope, then you will have to hold a council. The high diplomat also said that the source was his friend, Monsignor Bruno Heim, who was Roncalli's secretary at the Nunciature of Paris and that these words were said in the presence of a group of eminent personalities. Was it, therefore, the Mason and anti-clerical French president, 
Vincent Oriel who suggested to Cardinal Angelo Roncalli to call a council if one day he became Pope. 